It's Monday, May 2nd. You've got Goose and you're entering into the core. And today we're going to talk a little bit about NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And these are particularly popular right now on different platforms that allow you to buy, sell, and trade different images. And a lot of people, a lot of different artists out there have created entire collections and they have made them limited numbers. So for instance, you may find only 100 of a particular image and therefore the more people who own that, the fewer of them are available and therefore the demand and the price will go up for that particular image. So if you have an artist that's particularly hip and everybody likes, then you may have something that earns value over time just because there's the simple economics of supply and demand operating behind it. Now, there's also the smart contract component, which is very interesting, and different blockchains implement it in different ways. And today, I'm going to be interviewing Dor Tav Didishvili, who is the CEO of Miners of Cadania. And he's got some very interesting things to say about some work that they're doing with this platform on the Cadena blockchain that also involves our flux nodes. So without further ado, let's get into this interview. Dort, welcome to the Core Podcast. Thank you so much, Goose. Pleasure to be here. Great, glad to have you with us. And uh, I've got some questions for you about this project, which everybody is calling Moak, right? Uh, Mock. Miners of, oh, Mock. Okay, cool, Mock. Mock. And uh, that stands for Miners of Cadania, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what can you tell me about uh, Miners of Cadania right off the bat? What should we know? Well, uh, Mock, Miners of Cadania, is a small little GameFi ecosystem that we started building back in November, me and my partners. And the main idea is how can we have a small little gamified ecosystem within Cadena that can get you access practically to the entire ecosystem, both in the sense of providing utility and marketing for other projects, but also incentivizing users within the protocol with cross ecosystem rewards. So if you're right now participating in the mock protocol, obviously you're going to be able to earn uh, native tokens and NFTs of the protocol. But you're also going to be able to earn stuff from other projects that are building on Cadena. And even, you know, just projects that got tokens on the Cadena ecosystem, for example, Flux. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Flux does have a token on the Cadena blockchain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So you're saying that uh, in the same way that somebody who is mining on the Flux blockchain, they also earn Flux tokens on the Cadena chain miners that are um, helping with mock are also going to be able to earn other tokens for other projects yes but there's a big distinction over here and mock does not actually deal with active proof of work mining okay the game so itself within mock is a type of gamified approach to proof of work and mining in which Individuals basically combine and upgrade their NFTs towards generating yields within the protocol and the protocol pools, right? Okay. So not, we are not specifically pegged to a mining process like validators, right, or miners, but we are running on the Flux uh, decentralized infrastructure. Oh, that's cool. Okay. All right, and so uh, on Flux's infrastructure, that's basically providing the bare metal type hardware where you can run your application. Yeah. All right, cool. And then the well, token itself okay. is running on the Cadena blockchain. Yes. Okay. Cool. Basically similar to how Cadena is right now operating. Mm -hmm. And when um, somebody wants to gamify uh, their NFTs, via the mock platform. Uh, does that work similarly to what we've seen on some of the DeFi platforms where you can provide liquidity and earn for doing that? Okay, so the entire idea of mock is we're taking a lot of parameters from certain protocols and we're putting all of them in one nicely packaged surrounding. 
So you're going to be able to swap. You're going to be able to provide liquidity. You're going to be able to farm liquidity. Mm -hmm. and you're going to be able to access several more areas just by having everything in the same place in a very, very nice, transparent, convenient package so you don't feel intimidated doing those things for the first time. Mm -hmm. But together with that, we're going to have our entire play to earn area, which is going to be mainly, mainly, mainly about NFTs and how their utility is driving the protocol forward. Interesting. So the NFT then, um, now a lot of times we're seeing NFTs as uh, images. Uh, predominantly, that seems to be one of the number one use cases for NFTs right now. Do you foresee NFTs expanding into any other uh, areas besides images? They have to. Yeah. They have to. I mean, there's nothing wrong with an image because an image ultimately symbolizes something, mm -hmm. right? But what's standing behind that image is the actually important thing. I'm going to give you an example. In some NFT games, play to earn games, you got a type of scholarship system in which, okay, I have right now an NFT and this NFT can generate me value, okay? But I don't have time to play but I still want to accrue that type of value. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to find somebody and I'm going to create a type of gentleman's agreement with them. So I'm going to say, okay, listen, you pay me a bit of money. I'm going to give you this NFT. Just promise you're going to return that NFT to me in a month. What it is that we can actually do within Mock is create a type of rent contract in which the second that I agree to rent you an NFT, to lease you an NFT, we have a contract minted live, and that type of contract is a JPEG, and that JPEG has all details of the rent agreement written inside of it. And I currently receive that NFT as the type of receipt. Okay, this, uh, this is my contract. And this provides for some amazing utility because this is not a piece of paper, right? This right. is not just a picture. It's a proof of ownership that this NFT that currently is not in my wallet is going to return to me. Now, that gives you some extra utility saying, okay, if we know that the NFT ultimately needs to return to the holder of the contract, I can trade that specific contract, similar to how you would trade vanilla options in the traditional markets. So okay. now, not only can I rent an NFT, I can also sell this rent contract and when the contract expires, the NFT will go to somebody else. And that's good NFT utility that has amazing real, uh, real world case, uh, real world use case. And that can only happen because of Marmalade, which is Cadena's NFT standard. Okay. Well, that's cool. So the, the platform or the protocol has its, its own sort of NFT code. Uh, now, is, is this uh, related to the packed smart contracts? language okay so first of all cadena and its smart contracts are built on pact yes mm -hmm. taking pact and evolving pact into that small little niche of nfts you're getting something beautiful which is called marmalade okay if we're familiar uh, with ethereum in ethereum you got the erc 721 nft standard yeah take that Added custody, added control, basically take the entire idea of NFTs and give it steroids. You got Marmalade. <laughs> the idea is that you're supercharging NFTs to so much more than what they currently are, which is pretty much incredible, mainly for the security and control aspect and being able to enforce your policies. And that is the next step of NFTs, because if you cannot enforce your policies on your NFTs, there will ultimately always be a JPEG. Right. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Because um, what was it? OpenSea, maybe mm -hmm. a few months ago or whatever, there was like somebody wrote a program that scraped OpenSea for all the images and then just created a website that had all of the images of all of the NFTs. Yeah. And it's like, what, the, like, they're like super expensive ones in there, but like, they're just pictures. And know? more so, than that. OpenSea owns your NFTs. You don't Ooh. own your actual NFT if it's on OpenSea. It's not decentralized. For you to be able to actually deal with NFTs in a decentralized 
manner, you got to have something that is rarely available anywhere else, and that's called custody. Yeah. Marmalade provides me, for example, as a creator of an NFT collection to guarantee custody. Let's say right now I create an NFT collection and I say, okay, I want to be receiving a 2.5% royalty on every single NFT that's sold. On Ethereum, the second that that NFT leaves OpenSea, there's no way for you to enforce that type of code. Mm -hmm. The royalties are lost. They're only applicable if they're sold in OpenSea. In Marmalade on Kadena, it doesn't matter where you transfer your NFT. The same rules will apply. And those rules are incredibly important for the success of an ecosystem and project founders, right? Um, I don't want anybody to uh, pirate to an extent the stuff that I'm creating because I worked so hard on creating them, right? Right. And Marmalade allows you to be doing that in such a way that you can sleep well at night knowing, okay, my NFTs are exactly where they're meant to be, doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And that is all well and dandy. Because you've got the JPEG with all of the code in it that says this is the terms. All the terms are there. Basically, the code inside is so bulletproof that it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if right now it leaves my specific marketplace. The rules and policies that I decided will follow this NFT for life. Mm -hmm. And it's awesome. So what about alteration? Is there, a, is there a way somebody could hack that code and change things and make it their own and then feed it back into the system? Okay, so two different things. Uh, altering or upgrading and hacking. Two completely different things. When it comes to hacking, it's very, very difficult hacking a smart contract. But exploits are always possible, right? As we see in OpenSea, yeah. Solana, Ethereum, everywhere. Our luck is that uh, Pact is such a smart language and well-composed language that it is extremely difficult to be making mistakes. It is mm. extremely difficult to find loopholes in Pact because natively, Pact is built in such a way that it self-regulates itself as you code. You write something wrong, Pact will tell you, listen, you're doing a mistake. Or if you try to do things in a certain way, Pact will just not allow you to do so. Mm -hmm. On the other side, when it comes to the utility of Pact, you got upgradable smart contracts, which means you have right now published a contract, you deployed a contract, you decide a month from now, you want to upgrade it for one reason or another, you can. Now, some might say, but hey, this contradicts the idea of decentralization. Once you deploy a smart contract, hey, it's supposed to be fixed that way, right? Yes and no. A, you can decide that a smart contract can no longer be upgradable once you deploy it. It's just a line of code, yes or no, right? Ah, okay, all right, neat. Yeah. The other side, some smart contracts must be upgradable always always for the benefit of the end user ultimately in our case we got upgradable nfts because we want our nfts to evolve and for them to actually evolve we want it to be created on chain we don't want to pretend as if they evolve we want to actually make it happen on chain so the contract itself is part of a transaction that takes place on the Kadena blockchain mm -hmm. as a, as a token. Is that something that, you know, because I think maybe we could make distinctions right between a token and an NFT, right? Cause, mm -hmm. cause, cause there's in certain use cases, a token could just be a unit of money. Like tether is a token and it's pegged to the USD, or you could have an NFT non fungible token. And that's kind of in a, a league of its own, right? Yeah. In this case, you basically summarized it well enough yourself. Non-fungible. That's the main difference. Cannot be traded against another because they're not the same. Right. Unique. And that would include ownership and the terms, uh, especially if it's involved in a DeFi transaction. Yes, for sure. Okay, cool. I like this. It's very interesting. Um, it's abstract right now. So uh, how do we bring it down? 
for people to appreciate how this might work in the real world. Like, can you give me an example of someone who, let's say they got their NFT, uh, what are they going to do with it? It depends which NFT. But ultimately, um, our goal is to try and bridge that gap towards real world use case. Whenever you have something new and innovative, you always have the spirit of, uh, uh, let's say, the young uh, period in which you take only the childish approach because that is the sexiest thing ever. In our case, the JPEGs, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. The other side of it, from the board API club, going all the way to the other side, you got a scenario in which actual contracts, legal contracts between companies, world scale companies, those contracts are going to be signed and minted as NFTs, as proof and record. This is what was agreed. You cannot deny that, mm. right? So how do we make the transition from that area into this area, which is a much more solid, pragmatic, cold area that requires this use case? We do it step by step, okay? We take the things everybody knows and loves, and slowly we start pushing them towards the world as it should be. We spoke before about our rent contracts. That is a massive example of how things like that can actually be used. But I can give you another example, right? Um, within Kadena, uh, we have a very good function that exists called gas stations, right? right. Yep. People that come to my protocol, people that come to mock don't need to pay gas. I don't want anybody to pay gas when they come to mock, I think gas is a thing of the past, right? Mm -hmm. But even if I say I don't want anybody to be paying gas, I still want people to be able to have some degree of control over the priority of their transactions. So how do I do that while still um, preventing them from physically paying? Because I want to take those costs on myself. In our case, our approach is gas vouchers, different types of NFTs, that if you have gas voucher A on your wallet address, that the protocol says, okay, for this user, we're gonna be paying 600 gas. But if we have another user that has a more advanced gas voucher, we can define, okay, for that user, pay a thousand units of gas. That is another example of how NFTs can actually act as a a symbol for conditions to an extent, almost like a credit card, right? Or, it sounds there. more like a uh, gift card or something like that for a store, you know, like a it, or a, a VIP card, you know, if you have exactly higher. Like imagine, imagine right now uh, flying to New York and right now in the airport, you want to go to a lounge, right? Instead of having to shuffle through cars, you can just show an NFT that's in your possession that gives you access to certain criteria, mm -hmm. right? So um, access, policy decisions, agreements, uh, single-use NFTs, everything is possible. It's just a matter of how you want to define them. And right. for those things to actually exist, you got to have massive tech behind it to allow those things to actually exist. Yeah. So um, you did mention earlier about taking an NFT, for instance, off of OpenSea. And mm -hmm. OpenSea is where all of the terms uh, reside. So if you did something with your NFT outside of that platform, you're not going to reap the benefits of whatever terms you set. Uh, is there anything with Mock that deals with interchain operability, uh, moving the NFT off of Kadena and onto another chain and still have the terms follow it? Is that even a thing? I don't know. So, again, a couple of distinctions, uh, cross-chain and multi-chain. Um, talking to a Kadena fanboy like me about multi-chain and cross-chain, it's a bit confusing because already Kadena is uh, multi-chain, right? Yep. Right now, we're, we have 20 chains. Probably by the end of this year, we might have 50, 100, who knows? The idea is Kadena scales, right? So, yeah, of course, NFTs. To balance the load between them, we can move them between chains. The question is different. What happens once we take an NFT out of Kadena and bridge that NFT almost like a token to another blockchain? 
On that, unfortunately, right now, I have absolutely no way of answering. It is pretty tricky because Cadena has amazing tech. And there's a very, very good chance that bridging to another blockchain would mean, okay, you got access to a wider market, but you're going to have to settle on things. Mm -hmm. I do not enjoy compromising, but it's a development decision that's dealt by people all the way up top um, in the sake of you know getting a bigger market share with other blockchains. So that means then if you're coding for an NFT on Pact or uh, Marmalade, then you need to limit it a bit so that it would still function on other blockchains, which are themselves limited, like the ERC-721 uh, protocol. Yeah. I really have no idea. I have no idea because I never thought about limiting myself for the sake of something that might happen a year or two from now. Um, going from that assumption, I don't even think that's a... Uh, that's something we should even consider. Right now, we're mo more focused on, okay, we got this amazing tech. Let's go all the way. Let's push it to the maximum, right? We got things that we can do. We got things that we cannot do. Let's disregard everything we cannot do. Let's focus on what we can do. Let's go all the way. Why? Just because we can. We never considered, okay, what if right now we bridge to Luna or somehow we bridge to EVM, right? Will we have to settle for less, like take 70% of our protocol, compress it a bit, compromise on a few things just for making that happen? I don't know. Right now, I do know that what we care about is the core foundation of Mach, which is on one side, Cadena, and on the other side, our node operators in Flux. That is what we care about right now. Mm -hmm. In the future, if the op opportunity arises, and we can bridge to other places without settling on our fundamentals, we might do that. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that's a real visionary way of looking at things because it seems most projects are limiting themselves by working with something like the EVM. And it's it, it really doesn't uh, lend itself. I mean, it seems to be the one plat. Uh, one place where everybody goes, right? Everybody wants is familiar with Ethereum. A lot of people have mined Ethereum, so they've got Ethereum that they could spend. Or it's the second most popular blockchain out there. So if people are just getting into crypto, they're looking at Bitcoin and then they see Ethereum and they figure, well, if I want to be able to do anything with DeFi or NFTs, I got to get into that. And then they do so, but they're immediately slapped in the face with high fees and high gas fees and yeah. everything else. And you go, well, what? I, I just wanted to buy a, you know, a $1 image just yeah. to see what it's all about. And I had to spend $50 to buy the one, the $1 you image. Know, it makes no sense. I, I was not involved with that, but I think a couple of days ago, there was the Yuga Labs land mm -hmm. sale, right? Mm -hmm. They had this massive land sale for their metaverse. Right. Yeah. And NFT over there, I think, costs about six grand for a single NFT. People tried buying those NFTs for like three, four, five hours. So many people lost $5,000, $10,000 in gas fees on failed transactions. Ooh. Imagine right now you try to buy an NFT. Forget the fact that that NFT costs six grand. You spend two, three, four hours trying to buy that NFT, you fail. And every single time you fail, you end up paying an extra five hundred, a thousand dollars in gas. That's ridiculous. That's no, a type thanks. of Stockholm, Stockholm no. syndrome that people have a difficulty, um, you know, pushing themselves away from. So, so how does mock differ? Like, what's the you know? I'll, right off the bat, you did say you don't you don't want to see any gas fees, but there's still like this sort of NFT VIP thing for uh, different gas amounts. Uh, mm -hmm. But what's the cost? What's the typical cost to buy an NFT? Uh, or at least tell me about the gas fees on Cadena. I mean, we build on Cadena, uh, which is a massive privilege because not only on fees on Cadena so ridiculously low, they're going to stay low forever because Cadena scales. Cadena scales via chain web and being able to always increase the amount of chains you have just lets you in a smart way balance the load. 
this type of horizontal scalability allows us to always keep things in check, which is incredible. A thousand transactions, right? A thousand transactions, I would say it would cost $5, $10 in gas fees. I have no idea. Something like that, right? Which is pretty much negligible. And I'm more than happy paying for that because you know what's the worst thing ever, right? When you transfer, let's say, $1,000 worth of Ethereum and you try to buy something, right? And the transaction fails because accidentally you clicked on max and you left yourself no room for gas. And now what do you got to do? You got to go all the way, transfer yourself more Ethereum just to be able to conduct the transfer. That's ridiculous. I don't want to wish that on anybody. Yeah. So, yeah, as a rule of thumb, we do not charge for gas. We don't need to. Gas is so ridiculously cheap. Good. Well, that's that's an incentive in and of itself then. Uh, just to get off of Ethereum. Uh, yeah, but tell me about uh, one of the other things that you've mentioned, um, putting things like these NFTs on chain or, or certain aspects of it on chain. Uh, what does that actually mean? And how would that differ from what other NFT providers are doing with uh, OpenSea? I don't want to pick on them, but I'll go ahead. Um, how, how are NFTs stored physically mm -hmm. on something like OpenSea? and ah, ethereum okay. versus it. how it's stored on cadena okay so when we talk about the storage of the nfts we can talk about two things one the file itself which a, pi a picture a sound file a recording whatever on the other side the code what's known also as the metadata right in those two cases both on cadena and both on any other blockchain right? Files are usually not stored on chain because that's just not efficient, right? It's not efficient to take a 10 megabyte file and put it on chain. There's no reason for you to do that. I think on Kadena, we got about 200 something kilobytes of storage, you know, for an NFT or something like that. So what it is that you usually do, you store the value, uh, you store the file on something like IPFS, you link it via the blockchain on chain to the IPFS. And that's how you conduct yourself on the second parameter. You got the actual code itself. And this is where things differ between Kadena and other blockchains. Because the standard of the NFT Marmalade allows you to be just so much more powerful when it comes to the decisions you make and how to manage and enforce the policies that you dictate regarding your NFTs. But regarding the file, Thing. That's actually a different matter entirely, and I do hope there will come a time in which Flux will have their own uh, decentralized file storage as well. Ah, okay. Well, I could definitely vouch for Flux in terms of those who run their own Flux nodes, that you do have access to excess storage for yourself as a, as a node operator. So if you're one of the, the node operators, then uh, there's something called Flux Share, where you can share your own files with people. I know many people are already <clears throat> using it just to kind of send things back and forth to one another. But that's very niche because only there's only a certain number of people running Flux nodes. That number recently increased uh, more than double, more than triple, yeah, more than quadruple. Thousand, right? Already? <laughs> we're, we're doing very well with the node count. And what that means is an exponential amount of storage that uh, and that's just from the three different tiers and the bare minimums, right? Let alone what could in the future be added as additional storage options for cloud storage, for instance, like IPFS. Exactly. Yeah. The idea is just to have such a decentralized infrastructure that if I, as an NFT project founder, and uh, link up all the data on IPFS, I can still change that data. And you as the buyer of that NFT that just right now bought something, you don't want to wake up another day and see, hey, wait, the file was removed. Right now I got an HTML error on my uh, NFT. Right. right. So being able to decentralize that type of infrastructure is also something that is incredibly important. Yeah, I couldn't just agree so, more. You know, for you to have trust in the things you invest in or the things that you have or just knowing Nothing is going to change without you wanting it to change as the end user. Yeah, and I can't imagine how many people right now 
they rely on services like Google Drive or I don't know, what, OneBox or something, Dropbox, Dropbox. a lot of different things. Uh, uh, they, I, I don't know that those files are, if there's any redundancy, if they're stored in, in triplicate or what have you. But the, the thing with Flux is that already, because it's Web3, um, there's a minimum of three instances right out the gate of anybody's application that, that registers on the Flux node network. So I could see a similar principle applying to file storage so that exactly. if a node goes down and it happens to have your file on it, well, there's at least two others out there in the world somewhere that have your, I have a copy of it there too. Mm -hmm. And speaking about Flux Labs, uh, you just collaborated with DocuShield as well, right? Yep. And DocuShield are going to be uh, doing something extremely, extremely similar. You know, Adrian, I've been talking with him a lot. He's an amazing guy. And he exactly has that type of mentality that suits Flux so much, which is the idea of, okay, this is Web3. And if we want to support Web3, we just got to go all the way. We cannot settle on these types of things. Yeah, I almost, I mean, I, I, I can appreciate platforms like, Ethereum uh, and, and the way people have, you know, cre created these different DeFi sit, uh, sites that you can go to and trade and do all this. Um, however, there are so many, it seems to me, just limitations, not just the fees, which are ridiculous, but then you, you're limited in the smart contract language too. So at what point will people finally wake up to the idea that, hey, there are better blockchains out there that are working more efficiently or offering uh, far, like a vast um, more uh, configurability, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, um, it's a painful subject, <laughs> very painful. And I'm, before I refer to uh, this too as a type of Stockholm syndrome, but it's significantly worse than that. Uh, blockchain used to mean something, right? Blockchain was like, you know, this type of a uh, train that would always keep on running. But now you see blockchains, right, that you can turn on and off, on and off every Tuesday and Wednesday as if that's supposed to happen, as if that's a common thing, <laughs> right? These days, every single time you refresh Twitter, you see another article about an exploit that drained 90% of a vault or a treasury. And all of us are saying, oh, our condolences, right? Yeah. Uh, gas fees uh, with gas being thousands of dollars as if that's the norm. The reality is that some users, even us, right, to an extent, we don't mind settling on all of that just for the sake of some sort of comfort, right? Or the idea, okay, everybody is right now on Ethereum, that's where I I want to be because everything is over there because that's the popular thing, right? We don't care about that. We don't give a damn about that. We don't want to go where it's popular. Mm -hmm. We want to go where security is not going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. Gas is not going to be an issue. Scalability is not going to be an issue because Cadena scales. So we're going to be here 10 years, 20 years from now. And because Pact is good, I know we're not going to have exploits on mock. And because chain web scales, we know we're always going to be able to grow more and more and more without having to screw over our investors with ridiculous gas fees and then trying to rationalize it as if paying 50% from your transaction in gas, that's a legitimate thing. No, it's not. It's yeah, not. It, it seems just a, a way for miners to rip other people off. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. And then you've got the, the team that basically is like, yeah, that's basically what we wanted. <laughs> it's a matter of architecture, ultimately. Yeah. And I don't think uh, Vitalik ultimately planned for all of this to happen. And don't get me wrong. He's one of the most amazing individuals on this planet. He managed to make all of this happen. But Ethereum became too successful because it was not planned out to be that way. Yeah. But then again, you got uh, folks like Stuart uh, and Will Martino from Cadena saying, OK, we're going to build a blockchain, but we're not going to settle in the security. So we're going to have our own smart contract language. We're not going to settle on scalability. 
right? So we're going to devise our own model of making that happen. Yep. When you design something with the mindset of, okay, what's the most that I can withstand or how am I capable of, let's say, onboarding the entire New York Stock Exchange on my stock, on my blockchain, then you actually force yourself to build with that mentality. I doubt Ethereum ever aimed to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of TPS. And I'm not saying TPS is the only thing that matters. But what I'm saying is when you got yourself the proper mechanism of actually scaling something upwards, you don't need to be concerned about things like that. Yeah, I think it's interesting putting the whole New York Stock Exchange on a blockchain. Uh, isn't that what Ripple is supposed to be doing? Well, Ripple wants to be creating a type of payment system for settlements, right? Which is something which is a bit different. There's a difference between the technology to onboard every single transaction and the, techno the technology to just communicate between two parties in the process of settlements, mm, right? Okay. Two massively different things. Um, but yeah, the idea that Kadena itself can just withstand all of this load near infinitely or at least more than enough that's that's a good mentality to have because you know we're going to be here in the future mm -hmm. well we'll see what happens with other blockchains but i think it's really cool what kadena is working on um really intrigued by mock and uh, i like the idea of stacking your nfts and putting them to work for you on a, uh, in, a in a way of uh you know using DeFi. I think that's very neat. You call it GameFi, right? That's yeah. That's GameFi, it. not play to earn, which is a big distinction for me specifically because a, I do not like NFTs. B, I do not like play to earns. Uh, so somehow we managed to combine them both into something that I would personally actually like, and we managed to make it work. Neat. All right. Yeah. So if uh, somebody wanted to learn more about Mock, where could they go? Where could they find you? And the Mock.io, that is our website. And from there, you got links to all our socials. Or also, you know, just uh, go to Twitter, click on our link tree. You got to have access to everything. All right. well, one other thing I wanted to ask you about with um, Mock is uh, this is part of an IDO, right? So uh, what can we look forward to in time, uh, you know, time frame? Like what, what, when is your IDO going to release? So... And we have not announced our IDO yet. We have not announced the date, the white paper, the details, uh, the raise, or even the launch pad itself. What it is that I can confirm is we're going to be coming out with that announcement within the next couple of weeks. And the IDO itself will either be in June, July, and straight after the IDO in which we actually have the token generation event and staking happening, already at that time will node operators of Flux start receiving some very nice things from us. Oh, okay. So a little bonus if you're running a Flux node. Now, a lot of bonuses. A lot of bonuses. Well, you know what's interesting about that is Kadena uh, did that originally. Um, when they were running on um, Flux nodes, pe people who were running nodes were also earning Kadena if they were running the app. So um, is that going to be exactly, kind of exactly, the same idea exactly. here? Exactly okay. uh, why we're doing that. Uh, okay. To be honest, we're not special, right? We're not the first ones to be doing it. We're the second ones to be doing it. But in this case, we care about doing that extremely highly, right? We don't have to do that, but we want to, right? Uh, ultimately, node operators are incentivized by Flux. That's what they get for their operations. But it is of our opinion as long-time investors of Kadena and Flux and big fans and believers of web free and decentralization, that if you want to advance something, sometimes you got to be able to give to show people how much you care about those types of things. In our case, both to help bring and onboard uh, everybody on Flux to Kadena to have them be a uh, part of our big and happy family, and together with, sh uh, with showing them that we appreciate everything that we're doing as, you know, the backbone of Web3. So, yeah, we're going to be sending out a lot of incentives uh, to our node operators, both in the form of tokens and also in the form of NFTs.
Nice. And very, very nice different types of varieties. That's great. I uh, love to hear that. I remember the early days when Cadena first made that announcement and uh, it was yeah. like, oh, this is cool. So you're not just earning Flux, you're also earning Cadena. And now, you know, in the future, in the, in the near future, we're going to be able to add some NFTs. Pretty cool. I think people will appreciate that for sure. And something's telling me, right, that we're not going to be the last ones to do that. I have a feeling more projects will be doing the same. Yeah, well, it, it's a great model. I think it makes a lot of sense, you know, provided the, the project is it, it's within the means of the project. And, you know, you, you, you invest a little in the infrastructure and the infrastructure will carry you. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know? I, I do think it is within the means of every single project. As I usually say on our socials, it's a very small price to pay for decentralization, mm -hmm. right? It's a very small price to pay. And ultimately, it makes us feel extremely good about ourselves being a part of it all the way through. Yeah, it should be a small price to pay because it makes sense. You know, the, the whole centralized thing where massive data centers are mm -hmm. just holding on to everybody's data. Yeah. I think that's going away uh, and sooner than, you know, many people w might like, but uh, yeah. that's okay well, because once I everybody really gets shaken, you know, they got to shake things up and then they'll, they'll innovate and we'll have I mean, decentralized variations, which will be even better. Yeah. Look at it right now, running on Flux. How much does it cost you to run your D app on Flux, right? Two Minimal. free Flux a month, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's cheap. what a hundred times less than any other web two competitor. And how long does it take you to run your app on flux five minutes in our case, right? If you There's got it, if you got it all one. figured out. Yeah. Yeah. It's very straightforward. Uh, you know, it's right now, I think it's still a little bit more developer oriented, but, uh, in time, boy, that it's going to become, anybody can do it. It's going to get to that point where anybody yeah. can do it. And I think, that's when it's really going to take off because people are going to say, all right, what is this? Amazon Web Services? Nah. Because ultimately, <laughs> you're going to see a comparison, right? Right. $100, $500, $2. Which one you are going to pick? You're going to pick the $2. Web3, right? decentralized Web3 all the way, run on flux. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's great. Well, uh, really cool, man. I, I'm I'm really excited for the project. Uh, definitely looking forward to the IDO. Uh, so you're saying sometime probably June? June, July. June, July. Okay. Well, maybe we could uh, get back together and uh, talk a little bit more as we get closer to that time and see where you are. Um, in the meantime, where can people go to learn more about the project? Either in our Twitter, uh, the miners of Cadenia, you're going to see a link tree, click on it. You're going to see links to all of our socials or on our webpage, you know, uh, the mock.io. Okay, excellent. And we well, got an amazing community as well. That's great to hear already, right? Yeah, good. Yeah, somehow good. it happened. Well, th this is something that people are interested in. And they, I think that they recognize innovation when they see it. And it sounds like you're really trying to innovate in a way that is adding more use rather than just uh, novelty. <laughs> yeah. Novelty is nice, but it's not exciting. Right. Yeah, anybody can snap a picture. But to make it actually do something, that's pretty cool. So yeah. kudos to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again on the CORE podcast. Thank you so much for having us, Goose. It's uh, been a pleasure. There's only one way to go, and that's Web 3.0. Don't be evil, flex freeing all the people, flexing on them now like a cheat code. Flux gon' keep you from a breach though And you know we web 3.0 Don't be evil Flux being all the people Flexing on them now like